I feel like as co-founder, I do have to stand up for the fact that I feel that what we were doing was right and was heading in the right direction. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Sometimes the simplest questions reveal the deepest and most profound insights, like this one. Why couldn't Titan be more like Elvin? On the face of it, it's a rhetorical question. It should have been. But scratching under the surface of that question lies another level of intrigue that we're still trying to wrap our heads around. Hours ago, the Huffington Post published an article describing OceanGate CEO as putting innovation over safety. Really? Is that what he did? I think the best way to understand this question around innovation is to look at a functional, successful submersible and to examine how and where, but most importantly why, OceanGate deviated from these design parameters. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Welcome and thank you to the thousands who have subscribed. If you're new to the channel, you might want to look at the other, the alternative coverage I'm putting up at the same time as this analysis on OceanGate, which is looking at a real, playing out in real time, the investigation and arrest of Rex Howerman, the architect that is the suspect in the Long Island serial killer case. And so if you want to get a feel for what this channel typically covers, please check that out. By the way, I actually stayed in a hotel about 300 feet from the suspect's office just a couple of weeks ago. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So are these really, if we're talking about innovation, are we really dealing with advances in design, right? It's advances in design with a question mark. Were the design ideas really advances or was the design principle flawed to begin with? It's quite a simple question, quite a simple answer. And you don't need to be a, a rocket scientist to answer it. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that where OceanGate deviated, in fact, whenever and wherever they deviated, this also involved a cost saving. When they created something that weighed less, they saved costs. When they deviated from the material, they saved costs, right? And so if we're talking economics and only economics, then there was something innovative about this craft. That brings us to number two, fit for purpose, also a question mark. The key departure for the poorly named Titan was a sausage-shaped central cylinder. This deviated from the tried and tested sphere shape used as an industry standard in submersible design the world over. The milky white cushion-shaped limiting factor and James Cameron's lime green deep sea challenger both had spherical capsules for their respective crews, the one enclosed in a larger envelope of acrylic and the other in syntactic foam. The best shape to distribute external pressure is a sphere. That's not rocket science, by the way, it's engineering 101. The best shape to deal with internal pressure is also a sphere, where a rounded shape, in the inside of an aqualung, for example. Think about the various versions of this. Eggs within thin shells are nevertheless surprisingly resilient. Think about the human skull and fragile structures such as eye sockets and eyeballs. Dam walls built in a rounded fashion distribute pressures to the edges, to the physical sides of reservoirs. Also think about airplane noses, wings and windshields. All of these are rounded so as to distribute airflow best over them. One could theoretically argue that a cylinder has many traits of a sphere. It's rounded. The problem is it still offers up a contiguous surface for pressure to work on, to work it, to exert its weight, and to apply a kind of leverage to. And even worse, because of its length, it clearly offers an area for the extreme pressure to gain purchase on the vessel. Imagine this weaver bird's nest as an elongated structure compared to this more elegant and more effective spherical design. Seen in profile, the elongated sphere presents a horizontal surface. Horizontal surfaces in the deep sea or even on the surface are never a good idea. And that is why trying to drive a car through water doesn't really work so well. The most fragile part of the weak sausage-shaped Titan was the central section of that cylinder. 
And so if we're dealing with a design that is so clearly unfit for purpose, why was it used? That brings us to point number three, and it addresses this question of why. Why use this particular strange design? And the answer is it's a taxi to the Titanic. Consider for a moment both the science and the economics of taxis. In terms of design, you want a taxi that can take more than one passenger. This is true everywhere, but in some places more than others. In South Africa, where the economics of fuel come into play uh, to a greater extent, perhaps also the economics of passengers to some extent, there's a greater emphasis on efficiency, on economics. And so there's an emphasis on a larger uh, vehicle that can take more people, more paying passengers, and that is the minibus taxi. The idea really is to cram as many people into the taxi per ride as possible. So in purely taxi terms, Stockton Rush was trying to make a more viable taxi for the deep ocean than, say, a New York taxi. So instead of this, this. And that's really the bottom line. So if we return to the question, why couldn't Titan be more like Alvin? Well, because OceanGate were trying to turn submersibles into deep-sea taxis. Think about it. Taxis, buses, shuttles, airlines, pretty much mass public transport in general are by definition elongated worms with people inside, you know, row by row inside. So the Titan was the logical choice from a purely economic perspective, but a terrible choice from a deep-sea submersible engineering perspective. And so to call it innovative... This whole innovative narrative, like the name of the, 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 the submersible, was arguably a con job, another case of putting lipstick on a pig. Number four, what's the trade-off? Well, by getting more people into the sausage comfortably, the trade-off is quite clear. It's more money and profits at the expense of safety. That was exactly what some people thought was the reason behind the rust incident. That was also the subtext behind the 1996 Everest disaster, this idea of turning an extreme expedition into a money-making venture. Could people be trusted taking risks with others' safety if the name of the game was to make money? And that brings us to number five, aggravating the safety issue. You might say the Titan isn't such an outlier after all. I mean, this is the counter-argument. Aren't submarines elongated as well? Well, yes, they are, but they typically only dive to less than the quarter of the depth of Titanic, and that should tell you something. Whales, which also have a broadly similar shape to the Titan, uh, also don't go much below one kilometer deep in the water column. The Titanic, for reference, lies at around four kilometers. It's about 2.5 miles. Now, not only does the Ocean Gate throw away decades of design engineering in terms of the shape of their craft, they aggravate that situation. They aggravate the pressure conundrum by replacing tried and tested titanium, which has greater compressive and expansive strength, with cheap carbon fiber. And if that's not bad enough, Ocean Gate also seemed to skimp on the recommended thickness if one is going to insist on carbon fiber. OceanGate went for a 5-inch hull, 5-inch thick hull, instead of 7. And so what OceanGate were trying to do, also in the name of economics, was build a lighter sub. And lighter meant easier, easier and cheaper to transport, to offload, and to upload. But in practical terms, by choosing to use carbon fiber, this was like, it's probably not a great example, but taking an eggshell, stretching it out, and substituting the midsection with a section of super thin plastic, right? It might be good for a while until the plastic starts to perish after repeated cycles of being frozen and twisted and being twisted while frozen. In the end, it's a bad design made worse by the material he chose. It's also not innovative at all in the engineering sense he meant it. It's innovative within the much narrower, narrower definition of a money-making scheme. Number six, and then it gets even worse. Because OceanGate deviated from the contiguous sphere protocol, they ran into another issue. 
how to attach several different large puzzle pieces, each with different elasticities and material coefficients. And yeah, there are some beautiful slides from the New York Times that really make that really clarify what we're talking about here. But this creates two basic problems. You know, these different materials. The one is how do you attach these different materials? Because they swell and they compress at different rates. How do you connect them to one another? And then number two, how do you maintain the seal when it's going to be eroded during every successive cycle? In layman's terms, imagine after every taxi ride, a submersible is susceptible to delamination and needs to be waterproofed all over again, sealed all over again, and if, if not uh, replacing the whole laminate um, from the word go. I mean, that is like a taxi driver changing his tires after each trip. That's not what's supposed to happen if you want to run a good taxi business. Number seven, the CEO's number one priority. If the CEO's number one priority was safety instead of moolah, he would have tried to get his craft certified. And I think if he did do that the way it was, he would have very likely failed. If he knew this, if he knew that if he tried to certify it, it would fail certification, and he still persisted in taking people down there, well, then we're not talking about innovation as much as ego. Number eight, 2023 was Titan's unsafest year yet. Let me ask you a question. Would you park a Formula One race car outside in the sun and the rain? Well, it's hard to demonstrate more effectively than in a simple picture just how much Ocean Gate had compromised in terms of safety by the time of the final fateful season. On the one hand, there had been a number of successful dives to Titanic and the CEO took this as proof of the pudding that his cheap design worked. Ironically and in a sense counterintuitively, every time Titan returned from a season of dives to the Titanic, the safety layers surrounding it seemed to be regarded as more than sufficient, that they'd worked. So much so that by the final season, Ocean Gate was sort of abandoning one of those layers. And, they, they, and so they thought nothing of dragging it behind them in the ocean. The reality, if they, knew, if they knew the engineering, was that after each successive dive, the Titan was breaking up more and more, getting weaker and weaker. And so rather than evidence that the Titan could withstand the immense forces it was repeatedly subjected to, the Titan itself was communicating through snaps, cracks, and loud bangs that it wasn't withstanding them. But someone wouldn't listen because he was preoccupied with something else. Well, what was that? So coming back to the original question, was he really innovating or was he just trying to turn a submersible into a bus? Was he trying to convert a sub into a deep sea taxi, one that could fit in more tourists than a regular craft? Because that's not innovation so much as, as I say, entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial if we're being nice. Greed at the expense of safety if we're not. The financial narrative, how much did Titan cost? How much money had Oceangate already lost? That remains a known unknown regarding this case. So I'm not going to take it further than that. I do want to look into some of the aspects that we haven't dealt with yet. What was driving the CEO? Like what is really driving him? What is the psychology that we haven't dealt with so far? And then also some of the legal narrative, some legal documents have recently come to light. Where is the legal narrative going and what is the outcome likely to be? Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.